Okay, so uh, a warm welcome to everybody that's joining us. Can everybody just, by the way, put their uh, microphones on mute if you're not, if you haven't already? If you could do that for me, that would be great. Uh, so just as a, a warm welcome to everybody for those that are joining for the first time. This is the Influencer Marketing Roundtable, super informing, formal, um, and a great opportunity for you to uh, get lots of great content. Uh, this is going to be shared in the Influencer Marketing Secrets Facebook group, which if you're not already a member, do join. Um, we've got, I think, nearly uh, just under 700 members now. Um, so it's a great engaged community uh, of uh, like-minded people. Um, right, so just move on the slide, he says. Whoops, there we go. So just for those of you that don't know who I am, um, I'm an influencer marketing specialist. I host my own podcast, um, which if you've not subscribed to, uh, please do. Um, we've got, uh, I think we're about up to 53 or 54 episodes now, third season. We've interviewed everybody from the world of influencer marketing. Um, not Sarah yet, actually. We should uh, we should get a date in the diary, Sarah, <laughs> um, to talk specifically about employee ad advocacy, um, which is obviously what we're talking about today. But uh, lo lots of really fascinating people from all around the world. Um, I also uh, launched, uh, published my first book on influencer marketing strategy in March this year. So if anybody's interested in getting a real deep dive into what the whole sector is all about, then uh, that's available on Amazon and, and leading bookstores. Um, I also speak at events and host panels and of course if any of you are interested in working me on on a one-to-one -one basis then obviously that's what i do and super briefly because i'm not going to go through too much in detail but i run an influencer marketing program uh, which lasts three months uh, and it's really based about helping you grow your personal influence either as an individual or indeed as an organization and as a brand and at the end of the day we all want more revenue we want we want to be able to charge higher prices we want more customers coming to us and we want our content consumed by a wider audience and i go through a five step process uh, to ensure that that happens so if anybody's interested in finding out more about that, then uh, you know, do just drop me a DM and then we can talk more about it. Um, in fact, one of the things I do is a half an hour sort of uh, strategy session just to see whether or not there's, there's an opportunity to, to, to work together. Okie dokie. Um, right, so today's session is all about employees as influencers. Um, which I think is a real fascinating area and it's been a huge growth area uh, of late. Um, obviously, you've, you'll have heard the, the success and growth of social media influencers, but um, sometimes people forget that the most loyal um, employees are, you know, very keen and, and wanting to sort of be... Um, helpful about supporting the company that they work for but some organizations and brands just have, have not have missed that opportunity so uh, i thought to sort of uh, share a little bit more about that um sarah's joining us today and it's something that she's super passionate about so um without further ado um can i introduce to you sarah goodall uh, who's the ceo of uh, tribal impact welcome Thank you very much. Thank you. And there's, and because there's not too many of us, it's fine. You know, either chat with me through the chat window. I've just joined your group, by the way. Uh, so I've just, uh, Gordon, I've just gone onto your Facebook group and popped in there. Um, but yeah, can you see my screen? Which screen are you looking yeah. at? Which one are you? Employees as influencers? Yes. Marvellous. Right. That's the right one. So, yeah, if you want to chat with me, you just put your questions in the chat window or you, there's not many of us. Just come off mute and, and, and talk. Um, so, yeah. So Gordon asked me to talk about employees as influencers. Uh, it's a topic I really enjoy well, talking about, but also it's my job as well. Um, my background is marketing. I've always worked in B2B. Um, but mainly in the tech sector. So I've worked for companies like IBM, Hitachi, and most recently SAP. Um, and it was there that I was managing all their social channels for about seven years, from about 2010. Um, so very early on in social, when businesses didn't quite know what to do with it. And I very quickly realized 
that actually that I don't even follow the channels that I manage. I actually follow my colleagues on social media. And that's where I had my moment of inspiration, which is employees are a lot more powerful than the logo on social media. How, how can we harvest that as a business? How can we use that? Um, so I spent about seven years at SAP doing that. Um, <clears throat> and then six years ago, I set up Tribal Impact. So I took voluntary redundancy and set up a business. And now we help other organizations to do that too. Um, so Gordon asked me today to talk about, you know, employees as influencers, and I've split it down into some sections just to give you some ideas. We do this a lot with big corporate brands, um, but I think, you know, understanding employee motivations is quite key because different employees are motivated by different reasons for being on social media and building their influence. And if, unless you tap into the right motivations, you, you're just not going to get any traction. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the opportunities this presents, but also the risks um, and why you need to get it right. There are very common mistakes. There's lots of mistakes to avoid, but I've just picked three to share with you today, the, the most common ones that I see. Um, and then I'm going to give you some little practical tips to get started. Uh, and then hopefully we can have a good discussion about it um, as well. So think about your, your questions and, and things after. Now, <clears throat> this is me. I'm Sarah. Uh, I am a B2B marketer. I own Tribal Impact. So I run that business. Uh, I love coffee. You'd have seen me finishing this one. I only have one a day because otherwise I'm a bit too wired for the rest of the day. Uh, I love baking um, and Tribal has got a friendly bake-off going on at the moment with Onalytica where, you know, we're having a bit of a bake-off competition. Um, so you can check our Instagram account to see what disasters and also very good. We have some good bakers in the tribe um, and therefore I have to run to burn off the calories so I do like I've done a couple of half marathons um, but my big passion is activating employee voices on social and putting the employees <coughs> excuse me I've got a bit of a cough putting the employees in front of the logo now I've put my picture of my cat there because she's an old girl she's about 18 years old and you will quite often see her tail go behind me um, whenever I start talking she tends to she wants to come and sit next to me so um, and I thought I just better get it out there now so it's just not too awkward when when we're actually doing this so so there you go that's that's my uh, that's that's me that's who I am um, <coughs> I wanted to start by saying you know, you may not realize this, but maybe you do. Employees are already influencing, uh, whether they've got thousands of followers or no followers at all. It doesn't matter whether they're on social, the way they talk about your company, whether at a barbecue, a dinner table, to their kids, to their family, is already influencing others. Um, <clears throat> and I think, excuse me, I'm going to have a good old cough and get rid of this. Hold on a second. They're hopefully that sorted it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, they're, they're already influencing. Now, when employees start to be active on social media, it becomes a little bit more complicated um, because they start to influence um, within the realms of their social networks. And the way that they say things, the way that they word things, the articles that they share, all has some kind of impact on the way that they're influencing. Um, and this can cause trouble, but it also can create opportunity. But they are already influencing. So the way the, everything that you do, they're already doing it. Now, some companies, some more traditional companies will say, you know, we don't want employees on social media. They must not be on social media. That's fine until they go and get a coffee and lunch at Starbucks and they're on their phones in the queue waiting to be served. Um, they're on social media. So whether you like it or not, in the office, out the office, they're on social media. So you might as well head up to it and sort it out and give them some enablement. So employees are already influencing, <clears throat> but they're in different roles. And we tend to categorize at Tribal four different roles because we help to you know, activate employee voices. You've got sales activation. Now, sales have different motivations to a leader who has different motivations to a subject matter expert. Now, sales, for example, they're interested in driving business growth and, and building customer relationships. So if you talk in the language to them about how they can influence their, their sales, how they can drive larger deal sizes, increase their pipeline, create more deals into the pipeline, <clears throat> generate inbound deals, Talking in a language to the audience in that they understand is quite key. So understanding the motivations by audience 
is the key to activating employees and, and driving their influence. Another one might be general employee advocacy. So whether they're in a specialist role or not, but about talking about the pride of the company and the culture that they work in and what it means to build a professional brand and how they it can help them develop their career. Now, subject matter experts are quite an interesting one because we work with a lot of technical brands. Um, and these guys, they don't want to be celebrities. They're very, they're motivated very differently to be on social and drive influence to someone in sales role. A subject matter expert doesn't want to be a celebrity. They don't want thousands of followers. They want knowledge. They want to serve their customers better. So you need to know the kind of buttons to push with push for a subject matter expert. And then finally, you've got leaders. Um, and you'll talk here see a lot on, on social media about social CEO, the social C-suite. Talent attraction and engaging existing talent is a key job of a leader. Um, and their role really using social is probably more bucketed into that. So what's their motivation? It's going to be around that. So aligning the motivations to understand what drives what drives them to be influential is a key first step. And it's the step that most companies do miss because they see employees as an access to getting content out there. Now, as I said earlier, this brings a lot of opportunity. I mean, activating your employees to be, become influencers, it brings you reach, it helps drive credibility, it humanizes the brand, um, it makes your company more relatable, it puts a human touch, but also it drives authenticity. And it's a word that Tim and I often laugh about, actually, at Analytica, because authenticity is a bit overused, but it's, it is very real. Um, and people like real people. They don't, they're less trusting of marketing messages and much more trusting of what people say um, and how they relate. You only have to look at the Edelman Trust Barometer to see that, you know, brands, how brands are trusted over employees of a company. It's quite apparent that employees are more trustworthy, but it also drives competitive advantage. And that's a lot of the reasons why companies work with us, because they see this as a good way to build long term competitive advantage. Activating employees is not a one stop quick exercise. It's a program. It takes time. It's change transformation. And this is the sort of thing that, that can drive a competitive edge. But it also brings risk. Um, and employees that maybe that want to be influential, and we've seen a lot of examples of this, some I can't share with you, but uh, as long as I keep anonymized, I guess, confidentiality. I mean, just a classic picture for Instagram about you being at home, working from home, and you've just left a contract on your desk that you forgot to move out the way. Um, taking photos in an event of people's faces that don't really want they didn't really want to be known that they were at that event, but you've just gone to put it all over Twitter. So there's little things like this behaviors that can, um, you know, they can, they can put the brand at risk. It can put their personal brand at risk. Quite often it's mistakes. Very, very unusual that you'll find an employee that does things on purpose, um, but maybe disgruntled employees that maybe were laid off, they might. Um, and this is where activating employees on social does bring risk but they're already on social. So you need to mitigate the risk and get it into, into some, some um, control. Um, a good example of this might be um, an employee I saw in September uh, was uh, that they got into trouble because they were they, they working in an environment, a health and safety environment where they needed gloves on. Um, <clears throat> and they took a picture and put it on Instagram and they weren't. They didn't have gloves on. Now, that's the sort of thing that can bring the brand into risk because they work in the oil and gas industry. Not having gloves on on site is, is, a, is a safety risk. Um, and that's the sort of thing that could get the brand sued. Um, so it's this kind of thing. And it also gave away a lot of IP in the background, uh, technical IP that the brand had. So it's, it's very, uh, you know, uh, unusual things like that, that employees just need to be aware of in order to mitigate the risk. Another good one is picking fights. You know, a lot, a lot of employees feel like they need to protect the brand when they see people sort of slating it on LinkedIn. Um, they step in and then suddenly you've got an argument fueling and you just don't want that kind of thing. So mitigating Mitigating the risk is quite important. Educating employees on when to, to get involved and when not to. Now, I've highlighted this in the middle. You, you will have known this research from We Are Social, but, but this is heightened because over the last 18 months in the pandemic, employees turned to social media to stay connected with family, friends, colleagues. The, the growth in social media usage over the last 18 months is huge. Um, but that also presents the fact that these people have just launched themselves onto social without too much education and, and enablement around it. Now, I wanted to show you this slide, but I don't think I can 
um, do my little doodling on here. Let me just try now. Um, this is something that we use with clients because it, it allows you to understand when you socially activate your organization um, and you create employees of influence, there's, you need to monitor lots of different things and they all connect, all the dots connect together. If you want to socially activate your business, monitoring and listening, so I can use my little thing here, monitoring and listening at the top here. If you're using, uh, so uh, Gordon, you were talking about Talkwalker and their new uh, research that came out yesterday. We use Talkwalker to do monitoring and listening for clients. The insights that we find on here, we feed into our subject matter experts. And we say to them, look, we saw this trending last month, this article. What's your view on this? We do this with a customer called Henkel. They do adhesives. Um, and <clears throat> we found something on social listening where the Tesla, the electronic car, Tesla roof fell off because the glue wasn't sticky enough. Now, luckily, it wasn't Henkel glue, um, but we did get that trending topic. And then we fed it into here, into these influencers to create content around it. This is a great example of how you can join the dots together to help connect and build influence for your employees. Connecting those subject matter experts to external influencers is then another thing that you can do because when they're connected to external influencers, and this is what you do, Gordon, but you can co-create content with them, this is where you get reach that as a brand you'd never otherwise get. But by the way, when you co-create content with influencers and feed that into your advocacy tool for other employees to share, employees love sharing peer content over brand content so they're much more likely to share content from somebody here than somebody from the marketing department and then your sales teams can use that content to activate or shift or accelerate sales pipeline conversations so you can see how the dots start to sort of join together you can't just do one thing in isolation of everything everything needs to be connected when it builds social influence now, I'm going to talk a little bit about mistakes. I've only got three. Um, there are more, but I'm just going to pick the ones that I that sort of grate me a little bit because I see it quite, quite often. The first mistake is assuming all employees want to be influential. They don't. All right. I'll just tell you that now. Not all employees want to be influential. I'd say in my experience, maybe the top one or two percent of your employees want to be influential. Most employees don't want to be on social at all in terms of their workplace. So typically we see anywhere between 15 and 20 percent of your employees will want to actively part, be part of a social program within the organization. Of those, some of them will go into um, maybe sharing and engaging content. And of those, some of those will go into becoming influencers and creating their own content. So assuming when you buy, we see this a lot, people buy advocacy tools and they just think all their employees are going to be on there. They're not, they're not. So, and they get shocked when they've just bought a company wide license and they're not, everybody's on the tool. Only expect anywhere between 15 and 20% of your employees to be on that tool. Um, companies like Google and um, some of the big tech firms like Facebook, they're, they're hovering around the 50% employees, but you know, they're quite unusual. So don't assume all employees want to be social. The next one, assuming employees want to know how to react and behave on social, they don't. Um, somebody said to me years ago, what's common sense for one employee is not common sense for another. So don't assume that they know how to behave. You have to give really clear guidelines. Otherwise, they, they're going to go off message. They're going to think something's funny and it doesn't travel across borders. So you need to be really prescriptive about what's acceptable, what's not, how to behave, how not to behave. <clears throat> and the third one is lack of content and enablement support. So a lot of people feel that, you know, oh, they're really active on social. They've got thousands of followers. They're all right. But actually, they need help to create content. And this is where marketing can come in, using social listening insights to create agile content with their employee influencers that then maybe they can co-create with external influencers, feed into their advocacy program and enable the, the sales teams to share it to their, to their customer network help them create content you know part part parcel off a little bit of your content budget and put it into employee generated content because without that they'll they'll never be able to get over the hump of just sharing other people's content so this is you know it's a bit of a mistake that people kind of feel leave them to get on with their own thing but actually putting that support mechanism behind them really helps them and it makes them feel good and they get part of the the marketing machine 
So I'm going to give you some five practical steps um, to get started. The first one is really to know your employee personas. This is um, our tribal matrix. We developed this when, when we started the company six years ago. Um, when we work with customers, we always introduce them to this because it allows them to see where their employees are sat today. Now, you've got network size up the left and you've got level of social activity on the bottom. These are your inactive employees. Typically, these are the employees that activate their network when they need it. Um, they don't act, they're not actively on LinkedIn all the time. They don't you nurture their network. They just use it when they need it, when they need a new job, if they need an introduction to a customer. You know, they're very sort of active when they want to be, when they need to be. Up here at the top at the connectors, this is your classic B2B sales teams. They've got lots and lots of contacts, but they're all sat on their phones um, or in their email, in their Outlook. You know, they don't actually have them. They don't nurture them digitally. So that's your connectors. Then in the middle, you've got collaborators. So what we try to do is move these people into here because these people in the middle, they share and engage on a regular basis. So not only do they build a digital network, they share and engage content to stay front of mine with them, even though they're not physically sat in front of them. This is where social sellers typically sit. And then some of those, not many of them, maybe your top one or two percent in the organization will move into this final column. And the difference here is that these people are creating their own content, whether it's blogs, videos, podcasts, these people are creating their own content. And then that's the kind of content that you can put into the hands of these people, which then drives traffic to your website, which is where you can then start to track inbound traffic from advocacy tools versus paid versus organic. And this is how the whole sort of picture feels together. So down here in the bottom left hand corner, you're very much relying on offline techniques. They're time consuming. You can only do one thing at a time. You can only have one conversation at a time. The more you move your company and your employees up towards the top left, this is where you start to attract inbound like a magnet. People will find you. They'll find your company because they've searched on Google. They're finding your content. They want to talk to you. So that's that's how you move from pushy, pushy, interruptive to more attractive. We people come to us when they're ready. So that's the first tip. Second tip, support their best next step, because once you've mapped them to that matrix, you'll be able to understand what their next step is. Someone in the inactive box, their next step is to start building their network and sort their profile out. Someone in the influencer box that's already creating their content, you might want to connect them to external influencers. So really understanding, putting in a program that's scalable, and that that's kind of what we specialize in is making sure that you've got that next step place in, in, in action. What you then do, especially with your influencers, your top right hand ones, map and connect them. Which conversations does the brand want to influence and which conversations do they, the employee, want to influence? They might not be the same thing. There's nothing worse than plonking an employee into a conversation that they have absolutely no passion or interest in. So really have a look and say, well, what is your passion? And it might be something completely unrelated to the business. And that's OK. So you might have an employee that's passionate about diversity diversity and inclusion, um, about, uh, you know, industry topics, sustainability, uh, greener energy might not directly relate to your business, but it doesn't harm to have influencers in your business talking about topics that interest them. It gives another dimension to your business that shows you've actually got humans behind the logo. So think about how you map um, and then connect people to conversations. This is the point where you start to engage influencers. So once you've sorted that out, you can either decide whether you pay to engage or you do peer to peer. Which one do you want to do? Now, historically, when I was at SAP, we did a lot of the pay to engage. Um, and it kind of works. It's a short term fix. You've got influencers with thousands of followers. You invite them in and you say, OK, uh, we want you to come to our event, we want you to talk. Um, but it's very transactional. It's short lived. And once they've gone from the event, that's it. Peer to peer is much longer term. It's when you connect your experts to influencers, they build a relationship and together they co-create content. So, yes, you have to be in it for the long term. But those kind of relationships can save you money in the long term. And actually, it can help incentivize an employee because they want to connect to influencers and it becomes a more relationship driven approach. So understand your strategy.
And then the final one, and I've put on a list here because we partner with them like Gordon does, but measure and benchmark your impact. Know where you're sitting in conversations. Are you on the outside? Are you, are you at the center? Are you driving the conversation? And who are you connecting with? And how do you need to increase those relationships? If you're not measuring it, you can't, you can't see if you're making an improvement. And this is why we work with Onalytica. So just in summary, um, know your employee personas, know what they're motivated by, know where they sit in the matrix, because then you'll understand their next best step. All right. So make sure you understand that first. Put some context in your social media strategy. Don't use influence, employee influencers as a separate thing somebody else manages. It ties into listening. It ties into advocacy. It ties into social selling. So make sure you get the bigger picture. Don't try to do it in isolation. You've got to make sure you've got the tracks on the on the line, all right? So don't, don't let people go off. Don't assume that they know what they're doing. Put the guidelines in place so they, they're cruising along and they're not going to go into territories that they shouldn't be in. Put on an enablement program, support them, put some weight behind it, put some budget behind it. Employees don't become influencers overnight and buy magic. You need to put some support behind it. And then eventually measure your impact because it's so hard to measure the ROI of relationships. It's, it's just really difficult, um, but you can measure metrics and, and different indicators to see whether you're doing the right thing or you're getting close to the center of the conversation. Are you still skirting on the outskirts? So these are the sort of things, the tips that I would give um, going forward. And uh, yeah, and that's it, Gordon. I just wanted to, hopefully that was okay. I hope that was useful. I don't see any questions in the chat. Oh, it was but awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was absolutely brilliant. Really, really helpful. Um, and um, <clears throat> has anybody got any immediate questions before I um, dive in with a few? Um, uh, by the way, um, this is, as I say, just for those of you that I, did, I didn't mention already, we're going to post a recording of this in the uh, Influencer uh, marketing secrets facebook group so you'll be able to pick that up and um and uh, if anybody wants to uh, loop in with uh, sarah after that uh, then then i'll i'll share sarah's details uh, as well um should we just um come off the screen um, oh yes of course if, yes there we are so we can all see each other there, there we go. go there we go all right. um uh, has anybody got any burning questions uh, based upon uh, what sarah was saying No. It's always, it's always right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, um, it's really good and one of the things I was going to ask you is do you think there's um, for a company let's just say like Boohoo that actually uses lots and lots of influencers uh, in their commercial world is there ever a, an opportunity for the influencers to merge and mix with the employees of Boohoo and what's how's that relationship work, or do, do, does the do, would a business see them as two separate entities? Oh, that's a good one. Um, the, my the immediate thing that came to mind there was John Lewis actually, um, but they don't really have yeah or or Halifax uh, where they've used employees in their advertising. So I and Best Way did that as well in North America. Um, they have employees on the shop floor and they're taking in the tweets. So the customer service tweets are coming in um, and they're actually answering them on the shop floor. They've got little PDAs and they answer all the tweets, but they don't connect them with external influencers. And the John Lewis example I'm thinking of, because they get employees on the shop floor taking, you know, they, they'll put the clothes out and they'll take the snaps and put it on the Instagram account. Halifax, I'm thinking, because they put their employees into their adverts um, and they're very, they always have done for years, actually. I wrote some blogs about this years ago, but they're not connecting them to external influencers. So I don't know about Boohoo because they get their, I mean, they get their influencers online to do that, but do they get them connected to their employees? That could be quite an interesting uh, <laughs> dynamic, couldn't it? it could I suspect be. that they keep them apart because the influencers have their own sort of the way that they they influence the brand and how they showcase the clothes and things but i'm not sure yeah, well the only reason i say that is because it can be quite a great at, you know leading by example in a way and showing what's possible and and some of those uh, employees that are passionate about the brand may may in themselves uh, particularly you know if you think about social media influencers how many of them are women for example a huge percentage yeah um you know may, may well aspire uh to 
to sharing content from the brand in that way. So I, I don't know where that fits. And it was, I was just interested to see what your perspective was. Um, yeah, another one is I'm thinking of is Gymshark as well. I mean, they completely absolutely built their brand through <clears throat> getting their products into gyms through through the the wearers of their products, you know. And they didn't they didn't uh, invest in external influencers. They just got it. They got their products on on the floor, if you like, in the where it's being applied. And I just sure. think that's so clever. Oh, it really um, was. It and really they've was. got. And you know, they've not even employee influencers. They're customer influencers. And yeah. and actually. It, that's the advocacy piece actually it starts with employee advocacy they're the closest to your brand but then you've got partner advocacy and then even customer advocacy and and that is a classic case where Gymshark just jumped all of them and went to customer advocacy it's quite yeah. quite a clever strategy um, I was also quite interested in the fact that you said that not everybody wants to be an influencer and that's a yeah. really really good point um for example I had somebody come here and fit my um new phone in um uh, phone service broadband service because i changed from one provider to another yeah and because i he's not a salesperson um what comes out of you know it's almost like impartial advice yes and and i think a lot of these brands have realized that service engineers are a, a complete hotbed <laughs> of, <laughs> of opportunities back to the um uh you know back to the brand um, uh, presumably you've had you've seen you've seen this working quite well with perhaps mobile phone companies or or gas service boiler engineers and stuff like that and uh, um, w what's your thoughts around that so yeah thought, thought experts or specialist people they don't want to become influencers they but don't are, but are right <laughs> at the forefront of of that customer opportunity yeah, they're the hardest people to convince to be on social media as well, especially if I'm thinking of some of our tech brands, they're pre-sales consultants, they're technical engineers, they're the most trusted and they're the impartial ones that customers love. But can you get them on social media? Because you get this, I don't want to be a celebrity, I'm not in charge, I don't have time for that. And I get that. So I, for me, it's all about, and we have done this, I did this at SAP, we've done it for IBM, but actually tapping into the motivations of their role. Yeah. Now, I, I will tell you a story. I remember sitting next to this guy. I lived in Norway for five years. I sat next to this guy who was a supply chain technical expert uh, for the retail industry. And I, he was so knowledgeable. And I said to him at the time, you need to be on social. You've got so much to give. You know, you could scale yourself to so many more people. Oh, I'm, and I had the classic response. I'm not doing it. No, no, no. Anyway, last year, I had a look at his LinkedIn profile. And he's got like 11,000 followers. So I sent him a message. I'm like, what's going on with you then? Because he's creating loads of uh, content, video content. And he goes, I've just realized that the more I give, the more connected I become, the more experts I meet, the more customers I help. And he said, I've realized that actually... I, I was trying to hold on to my knowledge because I thought knowledge became was a was my value entity. But he said, I've realized I can help more customers. He said, and now I'm not just focused on the Nordics. I'm talking to people in Australia, North America, New Zealand. Um, and he said, and I love it. And he's um, so he's converted. Now he's the prime. I've got we've got a blog post actually on our website. If you try type in grumpy, um, you'll be, you'll bring up that blog post interview. And because he describes himself as a grumpy old expert, he said, and I just don't want to be on social, but I've seen the value. Classic example. So yeah, that's, that, that's that's a that's a very good example. Yeah. Um, and, and and also when you were talking about risk as well, um, yeah. that, that oh, yes. I think is a, is a really important point that you were talking about there. Uh, I mean, presumably then, um, you know, from an HR point of view, um, there would be um, policies and procedures about social media that people would 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 they. Would they sign or, or do you think that's too invasive? Do you think it's what's the what's the view about that? Because uh, yeah. if you have too many policies and too much structure, people forget what they should and shouldn't do, you know, uh, and Absolutely. then and then what happens? It stifles that opportunity of of engage of, of great possibility. You know, I, I remember seeing something once on a um, social media post, which was uh, and I used to work in the merchandise industry, and they'd laid out all of this merch for their induction inductees. Oh yeah. Uh, and they said, "Looking forward to our, um, uh, our our new starters today." 
And I just looked at it, I thought, what a great post, because it says to me, independently, they're re almost rewarding, they're looking forward to their employees. It was a great piece of content. Yeah. Um, and, and, and for the industry as well, it sparks people to think about targeting HR people as opposed to just marketing people. So it, it, did, a, it did a lot, that did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the policy is a funny one for me, because, I mean, when I was at SAP, we had a policy, but it was buried on the internet, right? It was 10 pages long. No one read it. Exactly. And if they did read it, you couldn't be sure if they understood it. Um, you know, so for me, I think the, the policies are a bit of a backup. We've done a webinar actually with a legal firm on this uh, to talk about, you know, the policy and, and how much strength it has. In reality, you've just got to teach got to put employees into scenarios where they can they they make a judgment call and then they then they understand because it's not until they apply it that they realize what the right action is to take um we learn so we put them in a you know we put them in different situations you just had this tweet from a journalist how would you respond you know would you respond um so i think you've got to do you've got to put put employees in situations so they can apply the knowledge yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we've got a little bit of a, um, a Wi-Fi down there. Sarah? Oh, she's gone back. Um, oh, the, the nightmare of... <laughs> uh, the night for nightmares of, uh, of Wi-Fi. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it? About uh, Matt, you wanted to raise a question. I think it's only fair for Mike to go first. He's had his hand up a lot longer than I have. Oh, Mike, have you had a... Oh, oh of course you have. You know what? I I'm couldn't back. even see it. Bless you. Um, <laughs> it's the colour of the... It's the colour of the hand. That's why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a way of changing that. I'll just <laughs> yeah, do, do, do um, ask. Do ask a question, Mike. I'm back. Sorry. Well, welcome worry. back, Sarah. Just in time for me to ask you, you, you a question. Yeah, um, go on. It span out of a conversation we were having a few moments ago. Mm. Um and it, it, I was thinking about it as you went through the presentation as well. It's a question about, you, you, I, I love the way you talk about motivation and understand the motivation of people and, and, and big thumbs up on that. What about encouragement um, or more directly incentives? Yes. Whether they're paid or competitive, what's, what's your view on incentives for employees to take part in this kind of activity? Yeah, so I have seen where, you know, a lot of people will automatically think incentives are let's give an iPad away, let's give some Amazon vouchers away. The people that share the most content, they, they're at the top of the leaderboard, let's reward them. Don't do that. It rewards the wrong kind of behaviour. Um, in my view, employees that are active on social, it's a lot more complex than that. It's about their connection with the brand. Um, it's connecting their personal brand to the to the culture and the and the company brand. So therefore, one time incentives, they're a little bit short lived. And for me, it becomes it's they they want to be incentivized by uh, priceless type activity. So time time with leadership team. So what we we did uh, at my previous company is we we took the top ambassadors or the top advocates. We took them to um, Sapphire now. Right. So we took them to their big event of the year um, and they became employee reporters. So for all the employees that couldn't be there, we sent all the this, these eight employees. We equip them with a camera and a device and we said, record on social so all the other employees can see what you're doing. And we got them to meet Richard Branson behind the scenes. And, you know, we got we got them to do that's priceless. That's, awesome. that's the kind of and that's untouchable. And that's the kind of kudos people who really commit to this are looking for, not the ones that are sort of share, 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 ding, I'm at the top of the leaderboard, can I have my Amazon voucher now? It's not, so you've got to, it's a complex area. So I've seen it done well and I've seen it done wrong, but that's that's my view. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, Matt, yeah, um, what, what's your view? Yeah, no, I just had a question really for Sarah on the, the actual type of platforms that staff should be using because from a linkedin perspective that's very much a b2b platform which i know a lot of my colleagues and employees be very uh supportive of being um active on promoting you know um various products and services in the business but when it comes to facebook twitter instagram that's more of an environment which is their personal space and i know a lot of the team that i work with don't want to have followers following them 
on personal platforms where they can see what they're doing at weekends or other activities. And we've tended to go down the route of setting up like a, a corporate account. So use Boohoo, for example, we call it kind of, you know, Boohoo Matt or something as, as that account. And then they influence that way. Um, I just wondered what your views were on um, a reluctance from some staff to use particular platforms to influence, which ties into their personal kind of life outside of the corporate world. Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, LinkedIn would be the number one for B2B. Um, but I, I think it depends. It certainly depends on the employee's confidence level, comfort level. Um, and ultimately, it's up to them where which platform they choose to influence on. Um, we we would give them guidance, so we'd say, you know, if in B two B, you'd want to master LinkedIn, and then. But if you, I always think though, if you want to go into a role of influence, and I always have this conversation, you need to be on Twitter because breaking news happens on Twitter. Influencers are at the cutting edge of breaking news; they're the first to know. So you can't, if you want to be in a conf in in that kind of influential role, you need to be in the place where the news is breaking. Um, so I, I often have trouble there because people are like, oh, I don't want to be on inf Twitter; it's too noisy and it moves too fast. And I, I get that, but influencers are at the cutting edge. It's where they feel most comfortable. But one thing I would say is, don't try and be everywhere all the time. So you pick your platform of choice and you go for it and and you master it. And only then when you feel comfortable, might you you move into other ones. Now, those that want to keep the private life separate, because I do get a question about do I have one for business and one for do I have a Twitter account for business and a Twitter account for home? Um, I used to have two Twitter accounts years ago. And I got honestly, I got fed up with be, being a split personality because when I walked out the office door, I was no different, Sarah, to the one that you get at home. So I actually merged the accounts and. And it made me realize that people prefer a little bit of the personal Sarah, the, not just the, the business Sarah. Um, and, and that made me realize, actually, that that makes me human and I'm not a different person. So if people want to lock that down, I would say, you know, keep your Instagram account private if you want to keep that to just people that you know that's absolutely fine we're not as a brand asking you to open up all your accounts and be influential everywhere you pick your platform of choice and you go for it so mm. yeah absolutely yeah no, i think that that, make, that does make sense and we've certainly tried to know our audience as well and instagram for example is a, a platform that a lot of our industry are very active on so you know we've actually set up for one of our business development guys his own instagram account and he now has probably a thousand followers on there and uh, every time he's out and about in in the marketplace he's obviously posting content for those activities so we've seen real um, fruit of that and it's just as you say probably just better understanding the audience and identifying that key platform yeah and where they're hanging out yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no thank you matt it's a really good question to be honest i mean where do you see some of the trends going sarah because as i say this is this is something that's been emerging and growing more recently hasn't it um i mean what one thing i i do love is when i see um a salesperson or a non hr person or a non ceo saying we're hiring yeah do you know what i mean it's it's almost yeah. as though it's it's um i mean I, i'll use an example of a company i know really well it's got a great employee culture fluid branding and i follow some of their sales team um two in two or three in particular and i get a real sense of that brand through these two or three individuals you know yeah. just smash my target this week you know hashtag love my fluid family Oh. is what she talks about all of the time yeah. um i get to i get to see the conference that they were at um on a weekend and what they did and yet i'm also understanding her as an individual so she's she's having fun but she's also loving her workplace and uh, but she doesn't ever come over as salesy she just comes over a passionate vocalist mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah, and it really is quite, um, my perception of that brand is really based around her. You yeah, know. the employees, yeah. Exactly. And that, that comes back to my first point about this is much more complex than getting a tool, 
bit doing a bit of training you know this is a change management program which is kind of tied into the culture of the organization Absolutely. because if it, you know without the love if employees don't love your brand they're not going to advocate for it and and this is where you know one of the first things i'd do is have a look on glassdoor to see how employees are rating the company and the ceo because if you've got problems there you're going to have real problems trying to get the brand looking good on social through the voice of your employees um to your to your question about the future and the trends i would say you know i i i have seen and i i employee advocacy has been around for eight years um i'm starting to see it taking off i'm starting to see companies making a lot of mistakes because they're incentivizing incorrectly or not treating it with you know that this is a change program not a uh, a tool um but I see the trend of, you know, I see a holistic approach to social activation. So activating audiences by role and recognizing that it is different by role. I also see, you know, looking at conversations and embedding employees into the conversations that they want to be in. So that piece with the net, the conversation maps, using social listening to create agile content. I see less content being created by marketing, more being created by employees. And we call this employee generated content so get getting your marketing dollars behind the employees rather than so much around the brand um certainly in b2b anyway it'd be slightly different in b2c so so yeah so they're the sort of trends that if i got my crystal ball out that would be that's where i see it going and, and I, I agree with you 100 percent. i mean i'm completely on board with everything that you've said i think the challenge for some organizations is is getting that internal buy-in because yeah. the finance teams are so driven and boards are so driven by return on investment, aren't they? Yeah. And and being and it's the same thing that we've had in the broader influencer space. It's getting and we we know there's anecdotal evidence of eleven times greater ROI with every pound spent in an influencer space. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, but um. You know, it's it's sometimes the biggest, and I know on Lytica that we both share contacts with have, have done a whole big piece on the internal selling about yeah. the impact of this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it, it's such a great opportunity, isn't it? But I, I, I do think it's 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 how do we convince uh, in in you know these 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 boards and teams to to allocate more more money? I, I guess it's through to trial and error to start with or some you know starting small with um with well i was going to ask you one thing sorry i'm jumping about a bit but um i spoke to a holiday company recently and they were doing a content challenge yeah. and um what they were doing in, across their hotels were asking all different departments with to share different types of content from the hotel experience yeah so you know you can imagine the chef's table can't you you can imagine <laughs> uh, you can imagine the um the poolside uh stuff you can imagine the people that take the 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 uh, holiday makers on tours yeah um, it's it's more than what i would call the stereotypical holiday shop you yeah. know rather than the one that's that's actually you know with with real holiday makers i love that and and that's the emotional side as well you know that's what people buy into and um so throughout lockdown some of our clients did mini competitions like that as well so just to it's good to do that in an internal environment so if you've got an internal social network or if you've got an advocacy tool that allows for internal content only you can get people to do view from your window kind of thing you know you can't there's no right or wrong answer to that and it's a really nice first step for um, employees to start creating their own content without getting it wrong. You're not asking them to write a 2000 word blog post, which technically might be incorrect. You're just asking them to share, you know, what, what's your mug like? We, we had one in tribal actually like mug shop. We had, you know, what, take a picture of you, your classic mug that you drink from in the morning. And we did a guess the mug shop. Whose mug is that? Or you could do, you know, your desk setup, guess the desk. We did guess the suitcase a couple of weeks ago. So you can do these internal content competitions where there's no right or wrong answer, which is a nice safe step into creating content and it's internal only, then you can start to move to external. Actually, you just uh, reminded me of something. Actually, when I when I was in the promotional merchandise um, industry, we ran a company, uh, sorry, a, 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 a promotional products week, which was around Desky. 
So oh, yeah. rather than a oh, selfie, yeah. we called it a desky. Yeah. It was literally everybody had to take pictures of their desk. Yeah. And of course, lots of promotional products around the desk. So it was a great way of uh, of, of doing it. But hashtag desky is, is, is a very good example of whose desk is this? Um, yeah. Or what does that tell about you or, or whatever? Um, I mean, you know, I, I think it was also important to mention like you did about the contract that I was uh, that was quite an interesting point that you made there um but 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 yeah I, I get it um but, to but, that point actually Gordon what you can then do is take the best bits and you can create a piece of external content out of that so you know marketing looking at driving internal conversation and and in, you know inclusion but then turning you know a bit of a tiled picture to yeah yeah, yeah, you know? so, yeah. yeah. well actually it's... this holiday company um from memory uh, i don't think they were necessarily asking their employees to share the content just take the content yeah yeah. which again is a first step so then for yeah. some of them they're not necessarily worried about putting it on their own social media but they're actually part of the story of the brand yeah. in their own different departments and i thought that was a really smart way of, of building um a real user generated experience yeah um, but um cool yeah, it's good it's good all so. right um um has anybody mark have you got anything to share at all any any comments that you want to raise Oh, no, I've enjoyed listening and everything. I've just um, talked to a VA company today about social media, stuff like that. And, um, so I was just wondering where you think I should get them to focus and start with, with my startup yeah, company. Yeah, you've got a startup company. Yeah, yeah, I'd, um, starting a few of them. Yeah. Of them <laughs> and plan on... Um, investing in them all the time. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'd, I'd certainly look first where your audiences are hanging out because you don't want to jump on a channel where your audiences aren't engaging. Um, and a classic of that for me is, you know, we thought conversations were happening on Twitter for a client and they were all happening on Reddit. Right. So which is a completely different environment to where they were. So they started putting their technical experts into those conversations. So I would do before you start broadcasting on social, do a little bit of work around where are your audience is hanging out? What are they talking about? What are the hashtags that they're using? who's influential in that space because who should you cite start sidling up to you know because that that and learning from and and listen 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 to the 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 kind of topics that are getting traction and engagement and and they're the ones that you want to start to and you know get get focused around that's when i'd start to then go into to sharing and and figuring out where you should be active so get them to do that first right. oh, yeah create some polls or something myself yeah even yeah polls and start to get you know get advice from i would do that you need a following to be able to do that um unless you use the right hashtags to reach new audiences but they can be quite quite difficult but um yeah polling it, on that matrix the top middle court box is a really good one for that they source content inspiration from uh, their their communities really good at that so Great. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, and Sarah, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. That was really insightful. And, I, right. I, and, um, um, and, and I know that a lot more people will look at this on the download in the group. So, uh, yeah, so nice. uh, great. We should definitely uh, hook up again uh, afterwards because I've got some ideas about some of the things that you've been saying as well. So, All uh, right. Yeah, yeah, Sounds yeah. good. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, Gordon. Thank you. See you later, guys. Cheers, Bye for Mark. now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, Mark. Bye.